Right, uh, thank you all very much for inviting me here today. Uh, it's a very great pleasure to uh, come down and see you all, to understand uh, what makes you all tick and to, uh, to what I want to try and do is uh, very much to outline what we've managed to achieve in the UK over the last 20 years. So um, as Vice Chairman of the Red Tractor Organisation or Vice Chairman officially of the Board of Assured Food Standards that owns and operates the Red Tractor Organisation, that's, that's very much a part-time role for me. It's uh, something that I just do uh, in the evenings or and go to a few board meetings a year and try to, uh, try to engage with uh, the rest of the board and consumers around the country as part of my ongoing day job, which is to manage a, an 11,000 acre estate in East Anglia, in which we produce about 60,000 tonnes of uh, produce on an annual basis. So I've got quite a full-time job as well as trying to do this on a part-time basis. Um, so, uh, my objective is very much to try and give you as much information as possible about what Red Tractor has managed to achieve over the last few years, why it was created, and that's, that's very important, uh, who we are, and uh, how, we, how we operate, really. So, um, I'll just move, move on through with that. It, it was really uh, sort of about 20 years ago that Red, the Red Tractor organization real, uh, needed to be, uh, needed to, to come into being and, and it was um, a very, di very difficult time in the UK for primary producers. You know, we had all sorts of things. BSE was starting to raise its head. We had uh, salmonella in eggs. There was, there was issues with contamination of grain, and it, it, it wasn't really a very, a very pleasant place to be at, at all as a primary producer. Farmer ratings, I heard Cheryl, I think somebody mentioned that we were uh, highly regarded of, as here. Um, producers, farmers were highly regarded, and we, we seemed to lose that consumer and general public uh, confidence, which was a very, very disappointing and difficult place to be in. Um, so you know some of the some of the headlines in the national newspapers were you know things like this, and the public just want the truth about BSE and goodness knows what else. Uh, we were also faced with a sort of a, a new food safety act that, that caused us um, pass the responsibility back to those people that were selling food to ensure that it was uh, produced responsibly and uh, that they knew exactly where it was coming from. So that, that was that was also another challenge that they faced. And of course, the, the, the retailers were exceptionally concerned about all of this at, at this time because it was, it was starting to affect, affect their margins. And, and what, they, what they started to do was build up a whole plethora of uh, sort of their own independent inspections to come out to the farm. And so sort of I remember in 97, we had about 15 independent audits from one supermarket or other. Uh, coming up the farm drive, and they were all they were all really ratcheting their standards up so they could sort of beat and compete against the other to sh to demonstrate that they were they were better. So that you know it was it was very clear that uh, UK UK producers needed to sort of counter that uh, three three pronged attack. So uh, th the aims that we started with they were very very clear. It was to protect the reputation, which was being very clearly damaged by what the issues are said. It was to provide a mechanism by f for farmers that um, we could demonstrate that we did have, despite what all the press were saying at the time, we did have uh, good standards of production and, it, and also to encourage best practice. And it was to reduce this uh, mechanism that I described where one retailer was out trying to compete with others to... Uh, to do their very best to grind us into, into the ground, really. And um, it w that was a very difficult time as well. Um, the, the other thing that it, so it needed to focus on having one set of standards and one inspector, because um, the, the time element taken in enduring all of these inspections was becoming very, very onerous, in addition to all, so all the other... Uh, complexities of the agricultural policy that we, we've got in Europe at the moment. So that, that was a very difficult place. So what, what we did um, over the, uh, the years from the mid-90s through to sort of 2000 was establish a whole, well, six independent schemes for each of the sectors. So we had the assured produce, 
They showed combinable crops, um, poultry, um, British pigs, and showed dairy farmers, and assured British meat, which is the red meat sector. And, and that, you know, everybody had, we all had our independent sector chairman and we, we all had our own staff and it was, it was, it was very disjointed. And one of, one of the other issues, because each, each little organisation was very protective of one another, uh, the, the fact was that you couldn't actually have one audit to cover all of the produce on your scheme. So a mixed, a mixed cropping uh, dairy producer or a mixed a cropping dairy and livestock producer had to have three independent schemes. So it was very, it was very clear that we needed, uh, from that initial beginnings of the mid-90s, um, by t the year 2000, that we would, we would need something much more effective. So we, we evolved, we, we were uh, proactive enough to evolve into, uh, into the Red Tractor Assurance. Now, initially, the, uh, it was just the red tractor that was formed out of all of those six independent schemes. And the union flag didn't appear on underneath it. And that, that was quite a challenge. But th what this did was give us significant benefits to British agriculture because we, we could now have one inspector come and do all six schemes. And that was, uh, that was clearly sufficient to uh, assist the supermarkets in their due diligence and, and equally some of the other, some of the other uh, retailers that we were marketing to as well. It gave us consistency in the standards because each of those six schemes all ran slightly different standards and uh, so bringing it all together was very efficient at, uh, at unifying the inspection process, made it very, very easy to do that. And this was the first time that the, f the producer, because as, as has been highlighted, we, we don't really want loads of people coming up our farm drive just uh, inspecting what we do and checking our paperwork and goodness knows what. So it, it, was a, it really all same came together, this stage two I describe it, where the, there was actually a tangible benefit for the, for the farmer. So paying his membership and then during the inspection, by 2000, he could actually go into the supermarkets and see the little red tractor on the shelf. So it, it became a real mechanism by which a tangible benefit, uh, so a, a farmer could start um, marketing his produce directly. And, and that, that, was, that was really a key, and that's where we come from sort of just being... Uh, an assurance scheme into becoming a, a brand or a logo. And, it, and we still have this real this real difficulty now in trying to decide whether we're a, an assurance scheme or whether we are a brand, you know, and people, people pushing forwards um, on, on two tiers. We've still got certain farmers that just uh, don't really appreciate the benefits of the brand, which I'll come on to describe in, in a moment. So, so today we're very much known as Red Tractor Assurance, and <coughs> the key to sort of sort of about 2002 was the ability to attach the union flag to the bottom of the red tractor logo and don't underestimate that at all european legislation on uh, on uh, labeling makes it incredibly difficult and the organization has fought, fought very hard over the last 13 14 years to retain the ability to keep that union flag attached to the bottom and it, it's very clear to me that union flag to the to the consumer means it's produced in Britain and that's all the research that comes back shows that. But we've, we're starting to see lots of union flags appearing over massive amount of produce in the UK now, but that doesn't mean anything. It means it was potentially packaged in the UK, that's about it. It doesn't, uh, it, it couldn't, it might not have even been packaged in the UK. It, it could have been processed in the UK or something like that, so and packaged elsewhere. You know, it doesn't it doesn't mean anything under under European uh, labelling law at the moment. So the key is the red tractor demonstrates the assurance part of it and the the, the fact that it's very much British produce. So that was the key when it when it all came together in uh, sort of the uh, early two thousands. Uh, Red Tractor Organisation is a small, uh, not-for-profit organisation owned by the British food and farming industry. So it's owned by the whole of the industry and has been right from the very beginning. 
There's a very small team of 16 people uh, in working out of two offices, one in London and one at, at Stoneley, which is sort of UK agriculture's headquarters these days. Um, the organisations that own it are principally the three uh, farming organisations across the UK, so NFU Scotland, Ulster Farmers Union and the National Farmers Union. In addition to those producers that are, own this uh, brand, this organisation, we also have involvement from the Food and Drink, Drink Federation, the British Retail Consortium that obviously represents the supermarkets and the multiple retailers and in include people like McDonald's in that, in that organisation there. AHDB is our, is our levy board, uh, so they collect levies from, uh, from all producers and they have a seat on the ownership board as well, Dairy, as do Dairy UK. So as you can see, it's a representatives from all of those organisations and they, they are the over, overriding uh, owners of that business and they meet, they meet twice a year. And it, it's purely uh, a devolved organisation, Assured Food Standards, purely devolved organisation, operates very much as itself with no influence from all of these people, but they, have, they very much do own it. Uh, should there be any major issues. Red Tractor today, <coughs> we have uh, just, it's actually gone up very significantly in the last uh, few weeks. So we've got almost 62,000 members. <coughs> 27,000 of those have uh, sort of combined enterprises, which gives 80, 80 89,000 uh, enterprises that are assured. I've got some figures here actually that demonstrate. Um, that um, dairy farming, that represents about 90,000, 90% uh, 90, 90 of uh, dairy farmers being assured in the UK. The, um, that's 90% of pigs, 90% of chickens, 80% of crops, 75% of produce, 82% of beef, and only 65% 60, of sheep farms are presently red tractor assured. So, <coughs> All, all of that very much demonstrates that we've moved, we've moved forwards and you know, they, are, they are significant proportions of certain sectors that are, are now farm assured. <coughs> Reminding you that that is to protect the reputation of uh, UK agriculture which was badly damaged 20 years ago. It allows farmers to demonstrate uh, good standards. It reduces the possibility of retailers coming uh, with their own schemes. And some of them, uh, some of the premium guys, such as Waitrose, are, are sort of nibbling away and sending out some of their own inspectors now. And we have to keep going back to them and saying, you know, what do you want us to do to ensure that you, do, you don't need to go around uh, your producers yet again? So th there's always the constant battle that, the, uh, that what we set in terms of standards aren't quite, aren't quite uh, up to standard for certain for certain of the uh, of the people that uh, that we produce for <coughs> the organisation. In addition to those sixteen permanent staff, there's about one hundred and twenty experts that give their time freely um, from across the food industry: farmers, uh, levy bodies, uh, independent uh, people on uh, who have expertise in animal health and welfare, environmental, consumer interests. You know, indeed, on the main board, we have a consumer uh, director who brings to the party what, what uh, they believe the consumer wants. So it, it has made quite a significant difference to, uh, to producers. And equally, what I'm going to go on to do now is explain how we, how we deliver on the objectives. So <coughs> firstly, firstly, what we do as an organisation is, is set the standards and that, <coughs> that involves a great amount of feedback from uh, all of those owners, all of the people, but also from uh, welfare lobbyists and goodness knows who else. And that's across all six sectors and more importantly, as I'll highlight later, it's across the whole of the chain. So the whole of the chain in, a, in the life of a, uh, an animal or in the uh, in the crop production cycle has to be assured. Uh, the scope of the standards is to is four key, key areas. That's food safety, uh, traceability and origin, uh, animal health and welfare, and environmental protection. So probably much the same as lots of other schemes that there are. 
And these standards are reviewed on the farm on a three yearly basis, but uh, emphasising that they uh, must be up to date and in line with current legislation. And some of them don't cover all of the legislation that they're associated with, which causes us certain issues when we're, when we're moving towards earned recognition of our schemes with, uh, with government schemes. And um, <coughs> they can be in conjunction with other schemes, so um, the, uh, such as uh, the British uh, Meat Processors Association. Rather than developing our own uh, schemes for large abattoirs, the British uh, Meat Processors Association have their own schemes, so we, we utilise their, their schemes for, uh, for our benefit. And it equally, um, certain transport, um, transport schemes, we utilise them uh, to ensure that uh, the transporter is red tractor assured. So we've, we very much do work with others to ensure that we, we don't duplicate the inspections. And, and that, to a certain extent, uh, that um, crossover occurs with government organisations as well. As I've mentioned, the key is that the whole stage m must be assured. So it's not only the six sectors <coughs> in the, um, at the farm level, it's also, in uh, using uh, meat as an example, it's also the haulier must be assured to move the stock from the farm to the market or the collection centre or directly to the abattoir. The abattoir, the processor must be assured and then the people that process and pack uh, have to be assured as well before it can appear on the supermarket shelf as red tractor assured. So it's... Sometimes that bringing all of those people together with all of their independent interests is exceptionally difficult and, and very onerous. And, and that the process still goes exactly the same for the, for the grain as well, or grain produce. The haulier has to be assured, um, and, the, and so does the processor. Um, <coughs> now, how, how do we uh, sort of manage to ensure that these standards are met? Well, we, we have... Um, a range of certification bodies that we work with. So rather than, rather than Red Tractor have a whole team of auditors running around the country, we, uh, we challenge, we subcontract that process to um, independent auditors, and I'll put some of them on the screen in a moment. And, th and they're there to certify and assess the Red Tractor standards that uh, our boards have set. And um, they, they're charged with managing the applications, uh, ensuring that their assessors are qualified and competent, and dealing with the, the non-conformity. So here's the six uh, partners that we work with to assess that, and some of them you'll, you'll recognise as uh, some major global players, SEI Global, PAA Kiwa, you know, uh, NSF. <coughs> but one thing that um, we do now, because there was a significant amount of complaints or disparity between how one of the certification bodies was operating and the other, we've now got a, a sort of global um, program where we, we train and we monitor and we actually shadow audits. So Red Tractor will go around with some of the independent auditors from each of these, these companies and, uh, and assess their level of competency and uh, ensure that we've got everything working to the standard. <coughs> and then, uh, then thirdly, uh, we've obviously got to manage the logo and uh, we do that through a process of uh, licensing those people that are uh, allowed to use it and, uh, and equally we put traceability challenges in place to ensure that they are genuinely buying um, produce that's been assured throughout its, throughout its chain. Um, <coughs> and of course we have to validate that um, which forms quite a big part of our business. So, but this is a key part to, to the business to protect the brand to ensure that it is doing exactly what it says on the tin. So, um, and then the brand, the logo, what we do is communicate the benefits out to the consumer. And one thing that we're having to do now is actually, seen as we're sort of 20 years down the line, we're having to go back and promote the benefits to the, to, the, uh, to the farmer, to the producer as well, because uh, we've, we've taken quite a bit of criticism over this last 
year or so with people genuinely forgotten what's, what's been achieved, which has been a significant and disappointing challenge to have to go back and revisit that. So we've implemented a whole new program this last year about uh, re-engaging with our, with our um, suppliers, basically. It's been very difficult. Um, <coughs> but part of the mechanism that we can do to assist with this is, remember we have our 62,000 members and uh, we have a whole range of stakeholders from right across the industry. So all of those people can be utilized to promote the benefits of the red tractor to the consumer. The, the, the organization itself runs on a very small uh, two and a half million pound budget. So what, um, what we red tractor have to do is to sort of coordinate the activity um, from across all of the, th the chain to uh, make sure that the message is consistent um, and we bring in people, the levy bodies are very good at spending uh, their element of uh, marketing budget on red tractor promotion as well and equally so are the supermarkets. So <coughs> the, um, on this very small budget we have about £600,000 worth of direct marketing budget that goes towards uh, assisting with all of with, with all of this, um, it's used right the way across the uh, from every retailer from Aldi through to the uh, high value ones such as Waitrose. There are one uh, one or two exceptions, principally uh, Sainsbury's that have, for all they continue to use the assurance scheme, they don't actually put the logo and pack because they don't feel that there's any benefit to it, and we do con continually keep revisiting them to ensure that. Um, we get that back on the pack in the future. <coughs> we're, we're now getting uh, significant benefit from third party caterers, so part of um, public procurement plans, so the N NHS, National Health Service, prisons, etc., uh, are uh, using the red tractor as a mechanism by which they can demonstrate um, due diligence for their, for their customers. So that, that's just a reminder of the four, uh, four mechanisms of how we deliver. So defining the standards, ensuring conform conformance, very clear labeling and checking of that, and then the consumer benefits. So some of, some of what we've uh, been doing in terms of the consumer messaging, which is uh, very much about uh, the brand. This is one of the strap lines that we've been using this last year. It's about trust the tractor. It's about... Um, it's about ensuring that people know where their food comes from. So it's very much on promotion there. And it's also about Red Tractor has the role of um, potentially reacting when there's a whole industry uproar. Uh, one we had two years ago was a horse meat scandal where there was an element of horse meat. And very, very thankfully, uh, because of uh, good traceability throughout our, our supply chains and such like, the Red Tractor wasn't implicated in that. But the immediate knee-jerk reaction from the, from the press and the media is to uh, approach Red Tractor for some form of statement to, uh, to demonstrate that we are um, showing good practice. Um, as, I remember, as I remember, it's on a very small budget, so this is just some of the uh, promotional activity that uh, Red Tractor has done itself. We host every year we have one week in September, so just before the retailers really get going on the Christmas campaigns, we have a bit of a hit on Red Tractor Week, and this is some of the, some of the things that we do. We've got a, uh, Alex James, who's a guy from Blur, I don't know if he gets across this way, but um, it, he's a, a pop star and uh, has quite, a, quite a, um, a target. He's quite good at the target market, so Lots of farmers say who's he and all the rest of it, and it doesn't really matter what we say. It's whether the whether the the shopper in that 25 to 35 year old age bracket will buy Red Tractor because he said it's good, and, and uh, so we have a big uh, PR campaign focused around that week, big social media campaign, and social media has become very important to uh, to promotion of Red Tractor. The um, some of the examples of stakeholder activity. So this one here is uh, uh, just the pork aspect, and you see they actually have brand, they've chosen the pork, they, they got chastised for this, for, for moving away from the, the uniform brand of Red Tractor and putting 
putting pork again underneath, so trying to hark back to their days when they were independent. But, but it, it, it's all just about raising profile. Uh, and indeed, the, the one with the football, the football team, the, the, uh, that's Bath City or somebody, and two farmers actually pay for that, um, for that look for the red track to, to go around the stadium. So in addition to the 60-odd thousand members, there's people take it on their own, their own back to, to go out and promote the brand. And it, it's, really, it's really very good to have a, an element of support from Red Tractor. We have a farmer toolbox, so farmers can ring up and say, I'm going to a certain county show or I'm going to a, an event this weekend to a farmer's market. Have you got the promotional material I can take with me? And, and that, that really works exceptionally well to help uh, promote the brand. The food service, uh, they, help, they help considerably. And this, uh, the one advert for the Kentucky Fried Chicken ran for almost two weeks in some of the main London papers last year. And, but it, it's very much got um, the Red Tractor logo at forefront. Uh, McDonald's on the UK TV have been running an a, a, a advertising campaign recently where they show that uh, they're using only Red Tractor for certain parts of their milk. And, uh, and other produce as well. The, the issue that they have in the UK is, of course, they buy uh, beef from Southern Ireland and mix it all together with ours, so they can't sell the, they can't sell the beef as just Red Tractor, but it's sold as assured. The uh, <coughs> examples of retailer activity, which is phenomenal, not just at Red Tractor Week, but all year round. You know, we've got, uh, we've got even te you know, we've got Tesco, Asda, Lidl, uh, Aldi, Morrison's, all, all buying into, into the benefits of, of this one logo to, help in, to help to produce, uh, to increase their sales. And uh, with, within the, the last year, we've also introduced a, a made with logo that doesn't appear on any of those. And so long as the proportion of red tractor ingredient exceeds certain levels, so beef pies, for example, uh, it can state that it's made with 100% red tractor beef. And um, so we've, following demand from the super supermarkets, we've moved on to made with logos as well as just um, prime, prime product. Um, so <coughs> what, what is the impact of, of all of this been to, to me as a farmer and to, to fellow farmers around the country? Um, because as, a, as I said, way back in 2000, that was, that was the challenge that we were faced with. People were getting a bit fed up of just having uh, inspections and not seeing any benefits. <coughs> well, some, some of the uh, consumer um, research that we've done this year is demonstrating that um, sort of 65% of UK shoppers recognise the logo, and that's up from 60% um, in the last three years, and you can see the, on, the, only, uh, the only one that we're beaten by is this, this fair trade. Some, some of the others uh, are, are not really featuring at all, but we're, we're very encouraged that uh, our figures are going up and theirs are coming down. So, um, But it, it, it's, still obviously a major, it's still obviously a major challenge to, uh, to continually get the message out about a brand. Uh, here's a bit more uh, work that actually fair trade did and uh, we were we were really uh, very appreciative that it demonstrated that uh, more more of our consumers would uh, buy the product as opposed to theirs. So it <coughs> it actually uh, it was useful for them to pay for it. So it, it's 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 re it's demonstrating some real quantifiable benefits to to the logo and to producers. I think that that should say 55 actually. So. This, this is what we've, the, we're getting back as feedback from uh, consumers, and, and we do this quite frequently, and the farmers criticise how the questions are asked and all the rest of it, but you know, we're, we employ professional marketeers, professional, sorry, consumer research organisations to uh, pick up on all of this. So we, we're seeing um, all of these, in all of these categories, we're seeing increases year on year, 2014 to 15, and this is because of the, the good marketing message that we're putting out. So. It, to the consumer, this means it's British, good animal welfare, good environmental practice, they know where it comes from, and because of that, uh, they, they're supporting British farmers, and um, it's an independent mark. So I think we're very proud of what we've managed to achieve in terms of this. 
And uh, I think it clearly demonstrates some real positive benefits to, to those members that actually help to fund the organisation. Um, just some of the, this was our, it's not coming out very well, but that's some of, that's this summer's organisation, uh, what we did as opposed to just having the one Red Tractor Focus Week, we had a massive amount of buy-in for this Red Tractor Barbecue Bonanza that we ran for sort of three weeks. And we put, a, we put a, a, um, a campaign on the back of it where people can win prizes. And the, some of the stats coming back from this one this year were, were actually phenomenal. 26 million radio listeners heard this over the, over the two-week two thing. 6.3 million impressions, ad impressions, 41,000 video views of, of some of the social media stuff. And we actually had nine, nine and a half thousand sign-ins to our Red Tractor, um, Red Tractor newsletter, thanks, thanks to this. <coughs> you know, and we're getting, we're getting ministerial support, government ministerial support, and, and lots, uh, lots of benefits from this. This is what farmers get out and do in the Red Tractor week. So, Events across the country, we go and stand in front of supermarkets and we, we tell the consumers what the benefits are when they're, when they're going into the supermarkets and we check that they've understood the benefits when they come out, which is a quite important thing. Um, and the, the other things that it gives us as farmers is it, it obviously gives us much mo more uh, wider market access. The, the supermarkets won't buy if it's not Red Tractor Assured. We still do have a market. There's still smaller uh, smaller retailers that don't necessarily buy to the brand so it gives us a wider market access opening up uh, more selling opportunities it, it also is quite useful um, in terms of assurance we can utilize the red tractor as um, to go along with other schemes such as um, organic schemes and and some of the environmental schemes that certain of the supermarkets are running as well so we can we can run that in conjunction with them and some of, some of our uh, levy board uh, information that's come back has demonstrated some really significant figures that um, since every year since 2005, being Red Tractor Assured has showed up to £80 increase in value per beast for, for a beef animal and up to £2.60 per head for a, uh, a sheep. So there's significant quantifiable benefits that we can see um, there back to producers. And one significant thing that we're really working on at the moment is to have this element of earned recognition from government organisations. Now, the local uh, trading standards, so the local authorities won't visit a farmer for a routine visit if he's red tractor assured now. Uh, admittedly, all of this has been forced upon, upon them because of budgetary constraints, but they've found a good mechanism by which they can, they can sort of ease their burden. Uh, food standards agency inspections, if, if uh, they reduce their frequency of inspection for certain aspects of it from 25%, um, so one, in one year in four visiting a farm down to 5%, so from one year in four down to one year in 20, that's dairy hygiene inspections as an example, others are feed mixing legislation and all sorts of things like that. So, and we're, we're pr very much pressing ahead uh, to work on that in terms of the uh, Rural Payments Agency that inspect us for our single farm payment from Europe, which uh, presently means that there's 100,000 inspections take place on UK farms because of that. So we're, we're very much trying to uh, get earned recognition from them as well. Um, I think, Ian, that's about all I've got to say on Red Tractor. Well, obviously, there's plenty of time for questions in a little while. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there's a roving microphone that Dave will kindly take around. So if you've got a question or a comment to Andrew, stick your hand up. Dave will bring the microphone to you. Um, please keep your questions relatively brief. And uh, Andrew, if you can keep the responses reasonably brief so we can get nine questions in the time that we have available to us. Okay, first question. Must be somebody. Gentleman in the green shirt. Dave? In the middle. Right. Where we are? Uh, 
our group were wondering how you go about um, the cost structure along the supply chain, like how much the producers paying, how much are the transport companies paying, the abattoirs, all the way through. How's that worked out? Okay, uh, good question. The, um, the, the two and a half million pound budget is made up um, 1,500 pounds from 15, sorry, 1.5 million pounds from the producers and it varies depending on sector. So uh, the dairy sector is based around literage that the processors pay. The red meat sector is based around a, s a single figure that um, the, pro the producer pays. And that doesn't vary no matter what the size is. So uh, somebody with 100 uh, cows, suckler cows, and a finishing 100 cattle pays exactly the same as somebody finishing 2,000. That's the red meat sector. So the uh, the cereal sector, cereals and produce based around the, uh, an area basis. So uh, it's up to 300 pounds for somebody with 500 acres and it goes up slightly, but th th that's capped off. So 1.5 million of the two and a, two and a half is from pr producers at varying different levels. The people who put the certification bodies take the majority of that because they have to put the people out on farm on an annual on an annual basis so red tra out of every um, out of for, for an example the uh, red meat sector it's 150 pounds for every producer 21 pounds comes back to red tractor as a royalty fee the remaining part stays with the certification body now the certification bodies can vary their fee to the producer so the 150 was an example, so it can be from 145 for one of the certification bodies up to 170 for another one, and, and that's the competitive nature that we've managed to introduce in the getting the certification done, which has probably kept it at relatively low level. I don't know, have I described that well enough? That's the that's the that's the prime that's the producer. Then, then the same happens for the livestock hauliers. He'll pay. One of the inspectors, inspection certification bodies, 500 pounds to come out and inspect his fleet. Red Tractor will get 50 pounds of that. So the majority of the costs associated to the to the person who's been audited is for the audit process. So that goes to the independent certification bodies. In addition to that, there's obviously the people, 600 and odd people in the country that are uh, licensed to use the logo. And the, the money that comes back from them is probably up to, that's again phased on the amount of throughput that they um, they put through their business. And a, p a very small proportion of that comes back to the red tractor again. It, it's a greater proportion than it is for any of the farm audits because red tractor itself carries out the traceability checks. We go in on an, uh, an annual basis or more frequently, dependent on the size of the business, and check back right the way back throughout the throughout the chain, and and so that, that gathers about six hundred thousand. The remaining point four um, million is for service level agreements that work that we do for the levy bodies in terms of collecting data and selling that data back to them. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew, just um, some commentary around the barriers to why, across the various sectors that you went through today, there was various uptake levels from 90% down to 60%. Uh, given that Red Tractor's been going now for, for a number of years, nearly 20 years, why all producers wouldn't see why they should not be in Red Tractor? That, that, that's something we ask quite frequently. The, uh, <coughs> obviously, the fresh milk with 95% is um, the liquid market requires that, so their their customer requires that. The other extreme is the sheep sector, which only got 65% penetration, and that is because in the UK we export 50% of uh, the lamb that we produce, and the export market presently doesn't require them to be red tractor assured. There, there is a lot more, uh, a lot more talk from the exporters now that they are wanting some form of assurance, so the potential. Uh, buy-in from the sheep producers as well but in addition to that it's the structure of the industry in the UK that you know the primary producer up up in the hills 
isn't necessarily a finisher. So it, it, if we have a weakness, beef and lamb is a weakness in the fact that um, to be red tractor assured, a lamb only has to span spend the last 60 days on an assured farm and beef only has to spend the last 90 days on an assured farm. And this is something we've been trying to address. And if, if you do set up an assurance scheme, make sure you make it lifetime assured right throughout the chain from the beginning. Because that, that's, a, that's a real weakness we've got and something we've, we're fighting very hard to address uh, at the moment. So you've, you've highlighted an issue. Uh, my question's going right to the other end. Um, <coughs> there was a, a slide in the middle there uh, talking about the consumer's recognition of attributes and associating them to the tractor, uh, red tractor brand. Um, most of them were, were very quite high, but there, there was a noticeable drop off for environmental. Uh, just wondering what some of the information is around that and why red tractors recognition around environmental standards is not as high as the rest of it. Yeah, and, that, that, and that's something that we're working hard to um, overcome. And it, I think um, those figures sh demonstrated the last two years. And, and what we've seen in the UK, when after the credit uh, crunch came around, that uh, consumer awareness, uh, consumer observation or respect, for want of a better word, of environmental issues fell from the top of the tree to the bottom. Uh, and that that was highlighted in that figure. You know that. It's all about affordability now, and uh, the fact that they were looking to protect the environment six, seven years ago now seems less, <laughs> less of an issue to them. But uh, just highlighting on that, and uh, one thing I'd forgotten to mention was the red tractor produce does appear on 12 billion pounds worth of food uh, at the retail end on the shelf, uh, and it, it's really difficult. And that's out of a, a total retail gross grocery spend of about 100. And 140, 150 billion, but remember, half of that is imported, so that's not eligible for Red Tractor, and uh, sort of another half of that grocery bill is out of out of home, sort of um, into into the into the uh, the other aspects of it. So it's um, it it is carrying a significant amount of uh, shelf space. So it, it's um, it's it's holding its weight, but the environmental issue is. Uh, something that we're disappointed that we haven't managed to get that message out to the consumer that um, Red Tractor does uh, carry great uh, environmental cred credentials, but it, the figures shown were very much because the consumer is not very, very focused on that at the moment. Andrew, very simple question. What would your advice be for us in Australia? Um, well, I, th I think the, I think what you need to be able to do is demonstrate that there's going to be s significant tangible benefits to the producers to produce. If you if you're going to build a brand, build a label, you've got to s to start at the beginning of being able to demonstrate that there will be benefits back to a producer. We s we came about it the other way because the we needed to set up these assurance schemes for the things that are highlighted and the brand very much morphed out of that. The when when we'd got everything settled down for five six years into it, people were saying, "Well, we we really need to use this as a a one stop marketing tool." And this is this is the key. You know, we, the, my table were questioning why we didn't just carry on with the independence, but th but the f the focus had to be that we, we UK producers, wanted one brand that was very easily recognisable on the supermarket shelf rather than sort of the blurring of uh, uh, assured British pigs or uh, assured British meat and people not really knowing what each of those uh, meant. We, f we focused our, um, our best efforts on producing one single brand, which does sort of another question seems to be is about the weakness of of having one single brand and the damage that one potential uh, scare can bring to that brand. So so all we can do to counter that is ensure that our standards are robust enough to, to fight off any of those issues and that the horse meat one was potentially, the pig boys were on the phone all the time saying, you know, if, y if you red meat guys wreck our brand, we'll, 
we won't be very happy with you. So we, we have so that's why we have to be so robust in uh, ensuring our standards are, are fit for purpose all of the time. Uh, just within regards to resistance from retailers, could you see somebody like Sainsbury's dropping uh, your logo as a way to try and divide and conquer and tie specific re uh, producers to that retail uh, to try and perhaps even drive down that producer's price and their profitability is up? Uh, yes, and, and Sainsbury's did drop, drop their logo, but what they haven't done, because they can't find uh, any... Uh, anything that's more suitable is drop the farm assurance aspect of it. So that I, I appreciate what you're saying about um, dividing and, and reducing the 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 price to the to the producer, but there's been a massive element of resistance from the suppliers to Sainsbury's. Uh, you know, in terms of the question, it nobody's nobody's taken their stock away from Sainsbury's because they've not selling with a with a logo on anymore but what they um what they are doing is is saying um you you must continue to use our our farm assurance because we we're not going to uh, have a Sainsbury's auditor coming as well as a red tractor because we do want to be able to supply Sainsbury's Tesco's Morrison's so rather than we're not going to go back to where we were in in the mid 90s and have loads of independent inspectors coming up our drive so so producers have been very firm in that in saying we're not moving away and not going to have you doing separate inspections, and we are dis we are very disappointed that you're not using our logo to demonstrate that it's British, and and then we get into all of the issues on the supermarket shelves of commingling of British product produce with imported produce, and that's where it the benefit of having 62,000 members inspecting the supermarket shelves on a frequent basis and we do we do name and shame them when anything like that happens you know big union jack logos with red tractors above promoting british beef for an example and then finding a, a bit of australian beef in the corner of that of that same shelf you know so and you know that does social media has been very effective in and they're very sharp very quick to react when when those sort of uh, issues are brought to their attention Okay, yeah, thanks, Andrew. I did enjoy your presentation. We're just um, wondering about uh, your members. Are they audited against any legal requirements? I heard the four type things, but I just imagine if um, we've got some legislation that's a bit obscure in Australia and sometimes um, members are not quite up to the legal standards. So I just wondered if, if that's part of the system as well. <coughs> yeah, the, I, would I would suggest that the foundation of the majority of standards are the legal obligations and we, we sometimes get a, a criticism leveled against us is it you know we ju we're just auditing farms for legal uh, legal obligations but that is just an element of criticism from the people that don't understand what the standards are so the the base the fundamentals for the majority will be the legal requirements so we check them and i, I um personally find that the red tractor audit is so exceptionally efficient at preparing me sh should I uh, be subject to a, um, a legal inspection from one of the enforcement bodies. So I get my red tractor inspection on an annual basis and the paperwork's all put in place you know, a day before or two days before. <laughs> but if I get a call from the rural payments agency, which they can give me 48 hours notice that they're going to appear, and if I uh, if I fail one of their inspections, then I get uh, a penalty of up to 50% on my single farm payment, which is a significant amount of money. It starts at 3% and moves up to 50. So I want to be sure that I've got everything in place when I have a an inspection, particularly from the rural payments agency. And the bit I highlighted now about the uh, local authorities is that because I'm red tractor assured and red tractor auditors checked most of the legal aspects and 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 some that they're not even bothering to come anymore and they're focusing their focusing their efforts on those people that are not red tractor assured so so we are that's a real quantifiable tangible benefit to to farmer members that they don't need to um, that they don't need to have these these inspections from lo local authorities <coughs> 